we have been going along for pretty much a, a long time. We've been building businesses for about 20 years, okay? And three or four years ago, I mean, we have been going to everything, reading the books, listening to tapes, going to conferences, putting in all the work. I mean, really pouring it out, working as hard as anybody else could possibly work internally within our company and the things that we are doing, the businesses that we are growing. Has anybody ever been there before? And we just weren't making it. We weren't breaking through. Something else was at work inside of us, and we just couldn't figure out what it was, okay? And we came across this program called Conscious Transformation by a guy named Joey Klein, who's an author. And if you want to write that down, Joey Klein, uh, and he uh, wrote a book called The Inner Matrix, okay? And you might want to write that down also as well, The Inner Matrix, The Inner Matrix. Great book, Conscious Transformation, phenomenal work. This guy's amazing, uh, amazing guy. And he really showed us what the barriers were that we were having trouble with and assist them to break those barriers down and to move forward, okay? And we started having unbelievable success. The, the, the invisible walls that were holding us back, which happens to do a little bit with emotional intelligence, once we knew what that was, because science is so far progressed right now that we understand kind of what's happening, that we can take a new approach, a different approach, and now break down some of those walls and start having success in areas where invisible things were holding us back. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, good. So what is emotional intelligence? Emotional intelligence, otherwise known as EI, is the ability to monitor our emotions, label them appropriately, and use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Emotional intelligence, EI, is the ability to monitor our emotions, label them appropriately, and then use emotional information to guide thinking and behavior. Pretty cool, right? Okay. Now, here's the thing. Daniel Goldman wrote, wrote his book, and in his book, they did a lot of research, and what they found in the research is that people with high levels of emotional intelligence have a very uh, healthy mental state, mental focus, higher level of it, higher level of performance, higher level of leadership. As a matter of fact, the book said... That EI accounts for 67% of the ability deemed necessary for superior leadership performance and matters twice as much as technical expertise or IQ. Pretty important, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about what that means, right? So how do you develop a higher level of emotional intelligence? Well, in order to develop a higher level of emotional intelligence, you first have to deal with and identify and become aware of what's called our epigenetic encoding. Okay, epigenetics is really kind of the study of the mechanism that triggers, okay, uh, how a gene expresses itself. Okay, it sits on top of our DNA without actually damaging the structure of our underlying DNA. And what happens is, is your epigenetics, what's called an epigenetic switch, is triggered when you experience, you know, trauma, stress, disappointment, things of that nature, maybe an argument with somebody that you're in a relationship with those types of things, right? And what they have found about epigenomes or epigenetics is that it's actually passed on from generation to generation through the parents. So as you're doing things and making changes, the epigenomes are changed and it passes on genetically to the t children and moving forward, right? Now think about that for a minute. What does that mean? Well, if the epigenetic switch is triggering based on trauma or experience that, that you're having, and it's triggering how you're going to respond or how you're going to react to something, and you didn't have any kind of design or influence over the epigenetics, then what is driving your behavior? Your parents, your grandparents, and again, generations for, who knows, thousands of years. It's built up over a time, and you become you come pre-programmed with your epigenetics. Your epigenetics are also influenced by your environment. So as you're growing up, you're, being, you're seeing environment and things are happening around you, and that's becoming what's called imprintation. You can write that down. It's called imprintation. You're also receiving imprintation as far back as in your mother's womb. All of the emotions that your mother is feeling, the anxieties, the fears, the love, the joy, all of it is becoming a part of your emotional being and a part of your epigenetic encoding. Isn't that interesting? And so if we're going to uh, alter or change, which we can, it's called uh, you know, myoplasticity. The brain literally is like plastic. I mean, we can reprogram our minds in order to achieve, and, and, and again, higher levels of emotional intelligence, then we have to train and reprogram our emotions. Does that make sense? Pretty good stuff, right? It's a real high level personal development. As you learn a little bit more about it, a lot of it's in my book. 
So the human brain has been conditioned for thousands of years to do one thing better than anything else. Identify a threat. That's what it does. It's designed to do that. It identifies a threat. Why? Well, survival, right? I mean, you know, thousands of years ago, we were living in caves and looking out for cyber-toothed tigers, weren't we? Well, we don't live in caves anymore, do we? Right? But yet we're still responding by identifying a threat in the same way that we would respond to, again, a, cyber to a saber tooth tiger, if that makes sense to you, right? I mean, so what's happening is, is as things are happening to us, we're triggering in our minds what's called fight or flight. It's our, what's called our amygdala, okay? It's part of our reptilian brain. And the amygdala triggers a flight or flight response, which is sending out a signal through your epigenetics, your epigenomes, and triggering a biochemical reaction that's firing off in your body, and then you have a choice to make, fight or flight. Now, in your career, and for many of you that are struggling to make the change or the switch in the relevance gap, right, whether that be technology, whether it be workplace identity, okay, or technical skills, any of those things, is that you're triggering. Are we okay? Oh, that's okay. We'll come back to that. <laughs> that's good. Thank you very much. That's, I, that's, that's me. I do that all the time. Yeah, so fight or flight, not flight or flight. Fight or flight, okay? We'll correct it later. Thank you very much, though. Um, but, uh, but anyways, um, um, where were we at? Yeah, the fight or flight response, okay, right? So we don't, we don't, don't, live, we don't live in caves, okay? But you go in your career... And you're dealing with technology. You're dealing with workplace identity. And what's happening is, is your amygdala is firing off. Your pre-programming, your epigenetics is firing. It's firing up these chemical reactions. It's coming and telling you to run or to fight, isn't it? Right? So we got to take control of that if we're going to be more effective in the things that we do. Right? So there's two types of emotions, right? There's what's called a fear-based emotion. And then there's what's called love-based emotion, right? So, and what is fear, guys? You all know what fear is, right? False evidence appearing real. We all know that, right? But what are some of the fear emotions that we experience? Anybody? Throw one out there. Anger. Right? Failure. Failure. Okay. Anxiety. Anxiety is a big one. Right? Anxiety. What else? Doubt. Doubt. Okay. It's emotion. Right? Lack what? Of trust. Yeah, lack of trust. Okay. So write some of those down. These are some of the things that you're triggering, okay, when you're in fight or flight response. Okay. And here's the thing, and this is what's kind of interesting, and this is what we're going to be training on. Fear is an emotion that's associated with an event from your past that's affecting your present outcome. Something that happened years ago. Because, see, that's what the amygdala does. When you have an emotional response to a trauma or a stressful situation, the amygdala fires, triggers a biochemical reaction, you get given a name, you label it, and you attach meaning to something that happened 10, 15, 20 years ago. And that emotion, every time something happens similar to that in your future, is triggering a set of emotions that happened 15, 20, 30 years ago that is now affecting your relationships and the things that you do and holding you back kind of these invisible barriers, if you will. Do you understand? Because your brain is designed to protect you from getting hurt. Does that make sense? Okay, so when you're sitting there and you're looking down and you've got that phone and you've got to start making your, your sales calls and you're you know, going out on your own to do your first thing ever and before in your entire life and the phone looks like it weighs a thousand pounds and you feel like you're trapped in a hotel room with a bobcat. <laughs> and you're like, I can't do it, right? Do you Amyg yeah, the amygdala, the amygdala, yes. Good, good, good. You guys are taking notes. Perfect, right? So, so let's talk about how to deal with that fear-based response, okay? So it's what we call the 90-second rule. And there's this uh, amazing lady, Jill Bolt-Taylor. She's phenomenal. Um, she really was one of the very first TED Talks that went viral. And what happened to her, which was interesting, was that she uh, had a, a brother who had mental illness. And she was fascinated. She wanted to know why the mind does what the mind does. And in 1995, she had a massive stroke, and she experienced the whole thing. She journaled it, and over the next eight years, she went through recovery. She did all of this research, and in the process, she wrote this amazing book. It was printed in 32 different languages. It's a big deal to what she did, 
And here's one of the findings, and it's called the 90-second rule. And it really has a lot to do with fight or flight and triggering emotional response, right? Okay? So this is what it says. When a person has a reaction to something in their environment, there's a 90-second chemical process that happens in the body. After that, and this is key, after that, any remaining emotional response is just the person choosing to stay in that emotional loop. They're attaching the emotion, okay, the biophysical thing, trigger that just took place. They're attaching it to the story and they're holding on to it. And the amygdala is doing what? Filing it away. For what? A future threat. That's fear. That's what it is. Now, how would you like to be able to change that? Yes. Okay. So this is key right here. This is good. So we're making progress. So an emotion cannot exist in the body without being attached to a story or an experience. So it has to be anchored to something. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Have you ever had that, that, that feeling when you're in, a, 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 you're in conflict with somebody? It's something that's never happened to you before, and it's a little confusing how you feel. Yes. Like, I don't know what to do. That's because you don't recognize that biochemical reaction that's going on, right? But when you have that biochemical reaction, like, for example, let's say you haven't seen somebody in 20 years and they have a, you have a huge grudge against them and they were horrible and something really bad happened. And then you run into them, boom, you just feel it right away, don't you? It's like it all comes flooding back into the body. What is that? Is it an emotion with a name or is it a biophysical chemical reaction happening in your body that you've given a name attached to a story? That's what it is. Does that make sense? So in order for us to stay relevant, we have to learn to how to separate the emotion from the story, okay? And then by eliminating the emotion, here's the rule. If the emotion, and it says right here, an emotion cannot exist in the body without being attached to a story, meaning that if we separate the emotion from the story, and the 90-second rule, according to Jill Bolt Taylor, says that there's a 90-second 90, 90 chemical process that happens in the body, and after that... It's designed to release itself. Do you understand? It's only supposed to last for 90 seconds. If I separate the story from the emotion, then within 90 seconds, that emotion should leave me. Physically, biophysically leave my body. Does that make sense? You all following me? Okay, now, if we learn how to do that, can we not go back through mindfulness meditation and assign empowering beliefs or empowering emotions to the stories that we are triggering that are holding us back and becoming the invisible walls that are the barriers that we're having trouble with. I always see a lot of people shaking their heads. It's good, isn't it, right? You all know what I'm talking about. The first time I heard this stuff, I'm like, this is unbelievable. I got to teach this to everybody. This isn't crazy. So we're gonna sh I'm going to show you the process of emotional reprogramming. So here's the steps, okay? So number one, we want to revisit. We want to revisit emotion, okay? We can do this. At will, by the way, we can do this in meditation, okay, what we call mindfulness meditation. I'm going to give you a quick demonstration of that. So we can revisit, okay? Number two, so we will re revisit past emotion or experience. Number two, we want to trigger the emotion that we actually felt when we were in that past experience. Number two. Number three, we want to isolate and release. Isolate and release the emotion. And then number four, we want to reprogram and assign Okay, again, an empowering emotion to the story. Okay, now let me give you an example. And it's in my book, but many years ago, uh, I had a little bit of a falling out with a very good friend of mine who was a mentor of mine. Okay, um, and what happened was, you know, there were some changes that happened and, uh, and I was upset, okay, of the changes. And I called him and talked to him about it. And he kind of made light of the situation. And he was involved in, in a way, but not in a bad way, in a good way. But because he made light of the situation, I took great offense to it. It triggered an emotion for me, and we didn't talk for two years. I lost two years of my business because I allowed something that I didn't even know was triggering an emotion for me that now damaged a relationship that was in my business that was very important to me, right? But I couldn't control it because I didn't understand what was going on. So when I went back and I revisited in mindfulness meditation, the event, okay, I triggered the emotion and I saw kind of what was going on. And, and, and I was, I think I was in a, a state of, my, my energy was a state of rage and anger. I was really upset. And in the meditation, I asked the mind, I said, you know what, take me back to the root of where this emotion is coming from. And what happened was when I was 13, 14 years old, my dad was an alcoholic and he left us for about, for about a year and a half, two years. 
And then eventually he quit drinking and he came back home and he really made light of the whole situation and life just took off where it left off. He never sat down, never explained anything to me, didn't go over any details with me, nothing. And what had happened in the event with my friend was the same thing. It just was unintentional. But what triggered was that emotion with my father. And I was so angry and outraged that I didn't talk to my good friend and eliminated, again, two years of my business. Do you think emotional intelligence is important in your business? Yes. You bet it is. So I went back through the mindfulness meditation. I revisited the emotion. I isolated it. I released it. Then I went further back and dealt with the emotion with my dad. Did my dad not love me? No, he loved me. He wanted to take care of his family. He was trying to come home. He just is doing what he knows. He didn't know. He didn't know. I went back and did the isolation, released the trauma, released the emotion, and I reassigned empowering beliefs to that. And then I went forward in my meditation and did the same thing with my good friend. And now every time something like that happens, I don't trigger a negative disempowering emotion. I trigger what? an empowering love-based emotion, and I'm able to power through, and I don't have these invisible walls. How many of you like to have that power? Okay, that's important. And what's, the, what's cool about it is the mind's very efficient, isn't it? Very efficient.